Good morning and welcome. It's great to welcome you to this our online service from uh, St Austell Parish. I'm joined by Carol, Carol Edelston, who we're going to hear from later. Carol, good morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, also, uh, Dan put us in uh, in order last week and said good evening and good afternoon because you could be joining us anytime and it's wonderful. Um, if you're a subscriber, thank you and, and please like this video. Uh, and if you're not yet subscribed, please just go along to um, uh, the icon that shows you you can subscribe. It's free of charge and just click that and you'll be sent all our latest videos and songs and all the things that are going on in the parish. So please do uh, subscribe if you'd like to. We're continuing our series of fruitfulness on the front line and we're looking at moulding culture today. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Carol just a little bit later on. But you're most welcome, particularly if you found us for the first time uh, or you're returning. Well done for finding us once again. And we're just going to pray to begin uh, our gathering together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to connect in this way through the technology. We thank you that we hear your voice through your word and through your Holy Spirit. And we pray that this time we'd be inspired by your Spirit, that we would have new thoughts, we would have fresh thoughts, we'd have fresh revelations from you. And Lord, we do seek your heart and prepare us, we ask, that you would enable us to share what we find. So Lord, thank you. And would you just inhabit every room, every gathering, every place where we are as family, uh, would you inhabit now? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue with some sun worship now. And you're encouraged just to, to worship as you can. Uh, a really wise man once said to me, Howard, you should pray and worship as you can, not as you can't. So however you can pray and worship and join in today, just do that and that will be wonderful. I am the Lord your God, I go before you now, I stand beside you, and I'm all around you, though you feel I'm far away, I'm closer than your breath, and I am
What a wonderful song that is, an endless hallelujah. Uh, that's something we have to look forward to in heaven, that there will be uh, praise for eternity in, uh, in body, mind and spirit. It's great to have Carol also here alongside me. Carol, welcome. And uh, you've done five months of your, of your curacy and everyone will be curious to hear how your curacy is going. How's it been? Well, it's been very different to what I expected because, um, as most of you know, I've been in the church for quite a long time and I've also been on courses and I've put other people on many courses over the years. And so one would imagine that I was pretty well organised and I knew what I was doing and that it would all just carry on as it was before. But the bottom line is, it hasn't been like that because when I stood at the, in the cathedral and I made my vows, what I didn't allow for was that God was listening and that he was holding <laughs> me to it. <laughs> and, it and it has been uh, quite a time because the course has not been what I expected because most of the course has gone on in my heart and most of it has gone on in my spiritual life. And I've just learned so much. I really have. I feel like I've been in a spin dryer and I've been wrung out to dry and... It might sound negative, but the bottom line is it's not. It's been incredibly positive because what it's been is a case of the Holy Spirit working with me. And so although I felt quite exposed and as though I've had a lot to contend with in, of myself, the fact that God's been with me through it all has been so precious and I wouldn't change it for anything. I really, really wouldn't. It's just been so special. I, th I think the hardest thing, Howard, was giving up the um, traditional service mm. because, as many of you know, it, it, by, by the time I got to Christmas, it became clear that my curacy responsibilities were getting so heavy that I couldn't do both. And I really regretted that. And I just thank you for your support through that time. It, wow. it made a big difference. That's okay. Well, yes. it's been great to have Carol in the team and um, it's challenging times, isn't it? These, these are really challenging times, the, the technology challenges, uh, the interpersonal challenges, staying connected. Um, but we're thrilled to have Carol here and uh, it's great just to have an update from you. And of course, in a moment or two, we're going to be hearing your message, which we're really looking forward to. So uh, we're going to move now to our Bible reading from Matthew's Gospel and then you'll see Carol uh, once again as she shares with us. So thank you, Carol, and we'll keep praying for you. Thank you. <laughs> the reading is from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Both my parents came from Glasgow. My father from Russian, Polish, Orthodox Jewish stock and my mother from a Northern Irish Celtic-picked, Scottish, communist, Gentile family. Not surprisingly, I'm completely mixed up. And not surprisingly, their union produced a very huggy-huggy, slobber-slobber, kissy-kissy family culture. Now, when it came to visitors, my mum had two rules. If it moves, kiss it. And if it's still moving, feed it. It was our family culture the way we did things round our home. And that's one definition of culture, the way we do things round here. Every family has a culture, Every workplace, every team, every church, every home group, every front line, a way of doing things around here. Some of it's good, some of it not so good, some of it downright destructive. Now my family culture never struck me as unusual until I got to about 10 years old 
and my reserved Southern English Gentile friends would come round. After a while, I began to notice their discomfort, how they would pad tentatively through the front door like nervous antelope, their ears cocked and their eyes scanning the terrain for danger. And then suddenly they'd whoosh up the stairs faster than Usain Bolt out of the blocks, all to escape the enveloping embrace of the kiss monster. <laughs> Now, the culture in my home hadn't arisen accidentally. My mum's huggy affection for my friends came out of a whole set of values about community, about hospitality, about food, and about an adult's relationship with her kids' friends. An adult has a duty of care to someone else's child. It is right and good for an adult to show physical affection to someone else's child in greetings and farewells. And it is absolutely imperative that food is offered and that food is eaten. My mother's behaviour emerged out of a set of beliefs. Our beliefs shape our behaviour. If we think eggs are bad for our heart, we don't eat many eggs. But when new research tells us that they aren't, well, bring them on. Scrambled, wet but not runny, with a smidgen of salt and lots of freshly milled black pepper served on crunchy hot toast. Beliefs shape behaviour. So the question is, how might our Christian beliefs, our kingdom values, shape our behaviour and shape a culture on our front lines that is more likely to help people flourish? How can we, as it says in Jeremiah 29, 7, not only pray for, but seek the shalom, the peace and prosperity of the front line God has called us to? What's good about the way people do things on your front line? What's worth cheering? And what isn't good, not only for us, but for others. In Romans chapter 12, Paul exhorts the Christians, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul knows it's pretty easy to end up behaving like everyone else, gossiping, because everyone else does, being a bit too concerned about the sculpting of your abs, because everyone else is. So we look for ways not only to change our own behaviour, but to change the way things are done around us. Perhaps the culture at your gym is very narcissistic, very self-focused. What could you do to make it less so? Well, maybe you might suggest that the Christmas party includes a raffle in aid of kids overseas who need cleft palate surgery, or that the money goes towards a table tennis table for the council's youth club. Perhaps you dislike the way that everyone in your family fiddles with their phones over meals messes up conversations. So maybe like one family, you make everyone pop their mobiles into a basket before the meal, like a sheriff in the Wild West, confiscating every cowboy's Colt 45 when they ride into town. Bow wow wow, wow wow wow. Mobiles and Colt 45s can be bad for relationships. Maybe you dislike the way everyone in the retirement home seems to just sit around watching too much TV. So you celebrate everybody's birthday with a multiple choice quiz about their lives so that residents get to know each other. Or you put on a family history hour and relationships deepen. And when a culture becomes more like a kingdom culture, that's fruitfulness. Culture is the way we do things around here. And so it's made up of pretty much everything. The stories we tell, the rituals we have, the rewards that we give, the heroes we admire, the slogans we repeat. Now there's good news and bad news in that. The bad news is that because values are expressed in all those ways, it can be quite hard to change a culture. The good news is that because values are expressed in all those ways, it can be quite easy to find a way to begin to change a culture. Before I tell you a story, you might want to pause the film and discuss some of the positive and negative aspects of the culture of your front line. Here's a true story. Elaine's a head teacher of a primary school in Glasgow. And one day, something really quite bad happened. A 10-year-old boy, a particular 10-year-old boy, who'd had a long history of being a troublemaker, and we'll call him Alex, had gone ballistic in the school playground, shouting and swearing and screaming. A member of staff had gone out to try to defuse the situation, talk to one of the other children, and was pretty convinced 
that actually Alex was to blame. A second member of staff came up and also was convinced that Alex was to blame. And then a third, and Alex then lost his temper and he ran out into the school field. Elaine, the head teacher, was informed. And she went out to talk to him. It wasn't me, miss, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. They wouldn't listen. They just wouldn't listen. Well, Elaine believed him, went back into the school and talked to the other child who was involved, who owned up. And then she went to the three members of staff who'd been involved and told them that Alex was innocent. And they went and apologised to him. And subsequently, the other child involved also apologised to Alex. I wonder what strikes you about that particular story. Well, one thing is that Elaine really, really listened to Alex and she didn't prejudge the situation based on his past behaviour. An habitual troublemaker learned what it feels like to be treated as if, as if they'd never done anything wrong before, as if the past really is the past. She made sure that justice was done. She showed other people the ways of the king. What was it about Elaine's school that three members of staff should apologise to a child? Well, when Elaine arrived at the school, she decided the kind of culture that she wanted to create. She knew that many cultures end up being blame cultures, where people in authority never, ever apologise. She didn't want a blame culture. She wanted a forgiveness culture. So right from the start, she told parents, she told staff, she told the children that she'd make decisions, but that she'd also probably make some mistakes. And if they didn't like something she did, then they should come and talk to her about it. And if she agreed, she would apologise and then go do something about it. And that's exactly what she's done. So what did Elaine do to mould that culture? She'd spotted a negative in her school's culture. She believed it could change. She identified a kingdom antidote and she gave it a try. Yes, Elaine was the head teacher, but you don't have to be an authority to mould the culture you're in. You don't have to be the boss, the parent or the team captain. Anyone can make a difference. I wonder whether there's something you could try that would make a kingdom difference, make your front line a better place to be, more like the way Jesus would like it to be. So wherever you are this week, Shalom. shine bright and it would be shining still but they all started turning on each other mm. you see the poets thought the dancers were shallow and the soldiers thought the poets were weak and the elders saw the young ones as foolish and the rich man never heard the poor man speak and one by one they ran away with their made up minds to leave it all behind and the light began to fade in the city on the hill the city on the hill each one thought that they knew better but they were different by design Instead of standing strong together, they let their differences divide. Then one by one, they ran away, with their made up minds to leave it all behind. And the light began to fade in the city on the hill. searching still But it was the rhythm of the dancers that gave the poets 
life It was the spirit of the poets That gave the soldiers strength to fight It was the fire of the young ones It was the wisdom of the old It was the story of the poor man That made it to be told That gives the poets life It is the spirit of the poets That gives the soldier strength to fight It is the fire of the young ones It is the wisdom of the old It is the story of the poor man That's needing to be told One by one will we run away With our made up minds to leave it all behind As the light begins to fade in the city on the hill One by one will we run away With our made up minds to leave it all behind As the light begins to fade in the city on the hill the city on the hill Father's calling still Come home To the city on the hill Come home This week we're looking at the fourth M Moulding culture And Mark gave us some great examples Of how culture can transform the negatives Into positives and we've all been there, that teacher that put us down. And then those teachers that inspired us to believe that anything was possible. I was a mum helper in my children's school when I was in my late 20s. And their head teacher was a truly exceptional person. He was a strong Christian in the largest state school in North Yorkshire. He was admired as such by Christians and non-Christians alike not just because of who he was, but the way his beliefs molded the culture of the school. It was a wonderful place to be. But he turned me down when I applied for a non-teaching assistant post. And then he gave the job to someone else. As you can imagine, I was absolutely devastated. I wanted to be part of that culture that he was creating. But he saw more in me than I saw in myself. And he offered me supply work in the school. And to cut a long story short, I ended up on his leadership team. And I only chose to leave when I knew that he was about to retire. And I moved on to my first headship. But it wasn't just me. I cannot remember how many other teachers left there and went on to be head teachers. And the reason for that is because we all saw the effect that one person can have on many, many lives, both directly and indirectly, and all because he was prepared to let Christ shine through him. And I thank God for that man to this day. And if you met Keith, you'd see a kindly, white-haired, older man. Sorry, Keith. But those of us who saw his heart saw something far greater. We saw someone who was fully prepared to travel the road that God had planned for him. He was a man of prayer, of complete faithfulness, and it was impossible not to have the highest regard for someone who loved so much. But how does this work? How did Keith become the man of God that he became? And what does it take to be the one who God uses to truly change the prospects of the lives of other people? Well, the good news is that God wants to use us. The bad news is it's expensive. It will cost us. But what we receive when we're prepared to pay the cost 
is absolutely priceless. You know, this service can't just come from us being determined to be a good neighbour. And some of us could manage that really well in our own strength. But God is not asking for you to show people you. He's calling for us to show people Jesus. And that's completely different. Let's look at that scripture. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We don't have to look far to see incredibly kind people who do not profess a faith. People who set up charities to help others. Some who would go into a burning building, taking absolutely no care for themselves, only concerned about saving the lives of others. And such people do a wonderful, wonderful job and we thank God for them. But the call of Christians is different. It's to be people with a life filled with the Holy Spirit, that the fruit of the Spirit will shine out on good days and bad, regardless of our personality or our preferences. And for us to be in that wonderful place where the Holy Spirit can influence a conversation and where we might even feel empowered to say and do things that are normally completely outside our comfort zone. My sister, who some of you, particularly the ladies, may well remember. She's a gentle lady and she spent her career with infant aged children. But she knew God was calling her to a new ministry and she felt prodded by the Holy Spirit. At first she couldn't see a way forward, but she continued to seek. And she's now the chaplain in a man's high security prison. It's a million miles away from the career she had. But my goodness, as she works there, she grows stronger and stronger and she thrives on all that God has given her to do. And although the prisoners may not see physical doors opening for them. She sees a true joy in seeing the freedom that can emerge within their lives. God has plans for you to be the salt and light, but it might not be where you expect it. And sometimes it will seem completely beyond you, but each of us thrives best when we spend time actively seeking God. Where does the Holy Spirit want to use you? What culture does he want you to change? We would love to journey with you, pray with you, support you, if you sense that the Holy Spirit's prodding you. Because our heart is to see you become the person God is calling you to be. From infant children to those considered highly dangerous, may not seem viable but God can do anything as we let him he will so let's not be trapped by the past let's get out of our comfort zones and move into what God has got for us in the future the challenge for my sister the challenge for you the challenge for me is for others to look deep within and to see not us but Jesus. Because the help that humans can give is temporal, but the life that he can give to those imprisoned is eternal. Humans can bring comfort to those who are down and trapped. Jesus can set them free. He provides a way where there is no way. And we're the vessels, we're not the solution. The big issue for us is that we are the vessels that he chooses to use. Our bodies are called to be temples of the Holy Spirit. Just imagine it. When people look at what is within us, they look into our lives and they see the supernatural Holy Spirit at work. And many of us know people who make a difference when they come into the room. And usually they're not the main event. But there's something about them that is different. And just sitting near them 
makes us want to get close to God. They're wonderful, aren't they? And God wants you to be like that. And God wants me to be like that. And if I'm being completely honest, I want me to be like that too. It sounds fantastic to be in such a place of peace and communion with God that it's the first thing that people notice. Count me in. There is a wonderful, wonderful picture in Isaiah. He's an Old Testament prophet. And he describes a view that he saw of God in the temple. And the temple was full, but it wasn't full of onlookers. It was full of his train. It was full of the hem of his garment. The whole place absolutely full. And it's interesting because that's what Jesus did. When people were in pain, when people were in difficulties, what did they do? They touched the hem of his garment and they were healed and they were set free. They brought their impossible situations to him, the ones that no one else could solve. And they touched the hem of his garment and they were made whole. In Acts 5, we read about people bringing the sick into the streets, believing that even Peter's shadow could be a means of healing. And to an unbeliever, this probably sounds like superstition of the highest order. But the fact is that the culture that we are called to share with others is the fruit and the gifts the Holy Spirit brings. And the times we spend alone with God in prayer becoming not what we do, but who we are. Then the more familiar with his voice we become and the more confident we will be to step out, saying and doing what he is asking us to say and do. And these actions steadily become spontaneous. The Holy Spirit pinpoints them to have the maximum effect on the person that we're seeking to help. That's exciting for them, and it's equally exciting for us. And we may look at the past, and we may realize that we've not been creating a positive culture. Maybe we spend time knocking people down in, when we should be building people up. This cycle is toxic especially if we are feeding it with more and more grumbles and more and more complaints. Peter's experience in the Gospels gives us a graphic account of a grown man who wept bitterly when he realised that he had let Jesus down. And if we feel that we have let him down, there is nothing wrong with tears. In fact, I would say that those times of sincere regret and tears have brought me to the most positive turning points in my Christian walk. There's something enormously intimate and precious in those words. Jesus turned and looked at him and Peter remembered. Jesus saw a man with great potential being limited by his own fears. Because Peter looked at the path ahead and he knew he didn't have it in him to stand up to those Pharisees or the Romans. Especially <clears throat> when they could tie up and torture his leader Jesus whenever they wanted to. But Jesus used this weak, flawed human being to be a major player in the changing culture that affects the whole world, generation after generation. Do not be limited by the failings of the past. Yes, we must learn from our mistakes and turn completely away from them. Start again if necessary, but the culture Jesus wants you to develop in your own prayer walk, in your family life, and with those you and I meet, is based on a light that radiates from our very souls. 
a heart that chooses each day to be a blessing to God and to be a blessing to all with whom we interact. And this light shines even in the darkest place because those who actively choose to be sensitive and willing to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit will minister to others. And as our bodies become filled, just as Isaiah saw, with God's presence radiating through our lives, then we really do see God's kingdom coming to this earth. Wonderful.
Well, we come towards the end of our time together and it's great to sing that song of worship, I Surrender All. It's been wonderful too to hear about the possibility of moulding culture. And that happens when we surrender all to God and he then shines through us. Shall we pray together as we draw to a close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Carol's message and everything that you've spoken to us. We praise you for your word, which says, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good work deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so, Lord, we pray that we might give you praise by our actions and deeds, but also by our attitudes and our hearts. Lord, as our hearts search for your hearts, may we be determined to share what we find with others. And so, Lord, we take a moment to thank you. Thank you that we're not locked up or shut up. Thank you that we're not prisoners any longer from our past or by things that have been said over us or done to us. Thank you that nothing in this world has to establish me as the victim of that thing. But actually, Jesus establishes me as a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of God. And so, Lord, we take a moment now just to pray in quietness and say, would you make us see through? Would you make us like a colander, shining light through that first of all comes from you? Father, we commit ourselves to be those that shine light in the dark places. We commit ourselves to be people who go into the places where maybe others don't go. Reach out to the others that people don't reach out to, to speak the word and act generously to the dispossessed and the marginalised, to the people who are unpopular and unloved, because you have first done that to us. So Lord, shine in us and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray, and may the glory and the praise be all of the Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to share with you. Do join us again next week. Uh, and notice we'll be having coffee uh, by Zoom after next week's service. So please do join in if you are able. You just need the link from our office or our daily email. Do subscribe, please, to the YouTube channel. Just simply click subscribe and, uh, and do share it with others who may not be able to join in with gatherings and services, perhaps where they live. Everyone is welcome in, into our fellowship. So now, uh, a prayer of blessing. Now may the Father, in all his love and generosity, shine in you. May Jesus Christ, who gave up his life so that you may be free, shine before you and show you the way to go. And may the Holy Spirit, the light of life and the power of God, shine and radiate from all your words, all your actions and all of your days. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, go with you now and anoint you where you are, both now and always. Amen. Thanks again. Great to see you. Go well, and we'll see you soon.
never gonna leave me Even in the valley you were with me Forever I will follow where you lead me Cause you are always faithful You are everything I want Everything I want is found in you You are everything I want Everything I want, Lord Everything I want, Lord Saving one, you know my heart, you know my weakness Still you gave it all for me, your love is endless You are always faithful But Lord, I know you're never gonna leave me Even in the valley you were with me Forever I will follow where you lead me Cause you are always faithful You are everything I want Everything I want is found in Everything I want, Lord You are everything I want Everything I want is found in you You are everything I want Everything I want, Lord Everything I want is found in you. You are everything I want. Everything I want, Lord. You are everything I want. Everything I want is found in you. You are everything I want. Everything I want. gracious and answer you have said seek my face and my heart responds your face I will see your face I will see you are the